So it's Triss versus Yennefer again, but this time, which one of them would be victorious if they fought one another? You guys have chosen this topic with an overwhelming lead in the vote, so it's going to be the first one, but I think I will still go over the other hypothetical encounters in the near future. Before we begin though, I wish to point out that this is not a whom you should romance video, I've already made that one, it's mostly about which of them is going to win in a straight up duel. Well, come on! Needless to say, I will not be taking into account the Netflix show It's a joke! where Yennefer's power is frankly blown out of proportion. Instead, I will take into account both the books and the games and I will base my final comparison on who they are in the end of The Witcher 3. What? And finally, let me warn you that there are likely going to be some massive spoilers about all kinds of Witcher media in this video, so tread carefully. Alright, let's start with a bit of an introduction for both sorceresses. Yennefer is the older of the two, at about 100 years of age in the third game. Possibly born under the name Yanka, which was later changed to the more sophisticated, I guess, Yennefer. She was also initially a hunchback and generally not so pleasant looking, but like most of her kind, she fixed it all with magic. She is also a quarter elf, but keep in mind that unlike Ciri, she is not a descendant of the Elder Bloodline. Now, Triss Merigold's age, on the other hand, is not clearly stated, but we could make some educated guesses based on the Last Wish book and assume that she was at least a mature adult by the time Ciri was born, which will put her in the mid-40s, potentially even mid-50s by the end of the games. So I think we can just assume that she's about half Yennefer's age. Not much is known about her childhood and origins. The only thing I remember is that she was good with herbs and alchemy. Herbs, schmerbs. But how about some Gwent, eh? This is possibly because in the books she is quite the minor character compared to Yennefer. And this is one reason why the comparison between the two is a little difficult to make. There is simply a lot more stuff about Yennefer in the books than there is about Triss, but we have to work with what we have, so let's continue. Yes, Geralt? So long, Triss. Both sorceresses have studied in Aretuza under the leadership of Tissaia de Vries. Both are veterans from the Battle of Sodden, where a whole bunch of mages fought and lost their lives. Both were actually injured quite significantly during that battle. Triss was burned and Yennefer lost her sight after a confrontation with Fringilla Vigo, who back then fought on the side of Nilfgaard. Luckily though, Yennefer's sight was magically restored afterwards and I will talk about Triss's scars and her allergies a little later in the video. But back to the Battle of Sodden. Should we assume, for example, that Fringilla will beat Yennefer in a duel? Well, not really. The Battle of Sodden was quite the large-scale fight, so it's hardly the best place to make that kind of judgement. But it certainly speaks of the fact that Fringilla is likely quite the capable sorceress as well. And once again I'd like to stress that contrary to what was shown on Netflix, it was actually Yennefer and not Tissaia who was blinded here by Fringilla. And also, this did not happen. Yennefer did not single-handedly defeat the enemy in the very end. Okay, what else can we mention? Both have served as royal advisors, both have suffered the effects of artifact compression, and both have slept with Geralt? Okay, so let's go back to their age. Yennefer is not just older, but more experienced and more knowledgeable than Triss. It's part of the reason why she was a better fit to be Ciri's mentor. This fact is actually integral to the plot of the Blood of Elves book, and it's acknowledged by both Triss and Geralt. Now, there is a sense throughout the books that mages get more powerful the older they become. Tissaia and Philippa Alhart are probably the best example for that. When the age of Philippa is mentioned, which is over 300 years old, it's also described how she is one of the very few individuals who have mastered the ability to polymorph, which is basically changing your shape, in her case mostly into an owl. You're about to tell me why you need the sunstone so much more than we do. Then you'll change into an owl and whoosh. No idea where you got such a ridiculous notion. Her immense powers are brought up in the games as well, by Cynthia at first, who talks about the mind-blowing illusions that Philippa is able to create. Philippa can conjure up the illusion of a garden full of flowers, fruit trees, and young elves of both sexes copulating merrily all the day. And the illusion is complete. The flowers have an aroma. 
The fruit and she-elves are juicy. I'd gladly see it. Professional curiosity. Naturally. And later by Geralt on the way to rescuing her. On the other hand, Vilgefort is obviously the massive contradiction. He is clearly younger than Philippa and may well be a little younger than Yennefer even. We don't know for sure, we just know that he's relatively young. But what we do know is that his power is significantly greater than Yennefer's, especially when it comes to direct confrontations. But regardless, I will say that Yennefer gets the edge over Triss here, not simply because of her age, but because she has seen, done and been through more than Triss, and generally speaking has the wider range of magical capabilities and knowledge. And maybe we could think of a way to lift the curse, together. I don't know, Geralt. Maybe try feeding him his own haunch? I don't really care. Okay, next up, let's talk about their mental fortitude and personality traits that might help them in such a direct confrontation. Yes, 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 come. Yennefer is an absolute powerhouse in that department. She is willing to do more or less anything to achieve her goals. She would take a stand against her fellow sorceresses, endure extensive torture by Vilgefortz himself, seduce people, break rules and sacred customs, destroy gardens, and very nearly destroy herself, if needed. Now, she is not completely insensitive about these things, they do affect her at various levels, and you could argue whether or not they're always the right course of action, but still, it is safe to say that she will not stop at anything to get what she wants, and that is of great importance. I think I shall simply stay in the shade. And you'll bring me cool drinks. At regular intervals. What are you going to do? Lie down in the sun and not move an inch. In terms of our dear darling Triss, I was not very nice to her when I summarized her initial personality. She is selfish and cowardly and kind of pathetic at times. She's also easily manipulated by her superiors. Potentially even swayed into some lesbomancy. My favorite type of magic. But it's more or less true. Additionally, it is said that she got scared and panicked during the Battle of Sodden. It happened during the most dire moments for the North. She was badly injured, covered in blood, and surrounded by the corpses of her friends. But still, the fact remains. Now, luckily for her, Triss improves a bit over time. In the end of the books, there is a small part where she's finally overcoming her fears. Um, it's even said that she would eventually be remembered as Triss the Fearless, or something like that, which seems like a bit of an overstatement really, but still, it appears that the games pick up on that and she keeps growing a little bit more throughout the second and the third one, eventually getting up to the point where she plays the most crucial role in saving the mages from Novigrad, she also endures torture to help Geralt find Ciri, though not as extensive as Yennefer, and finally, without any hesitation, she faces the Wild Hunt to help save her friends, even if Geralt refused to help her and left her alone in the city after learning what he needed. Triss, I can't do this. Can't help. Ciri's in danger. I'm sorry. With all that said, however, I believe that Triss will still fall behind when it comes to her strength of will and determination when compared to Yennefer. So, it seems we have two points in favor of the raven-haired competitor for now. Finally, we move on to what's arguably the most important question. How powerful are Triss and Yennefer in the context of a 1v1 type encounter to the death, and which one of them possesses the right abilities and sheer magical potential to defeat the other? Well, that is a little difficult to tell for a few reasons. First off, unlike Star Wars, for example, where Force users fight each other all the time, alone, in groups, on battlefields and in all kinds of ways, mages in The Witcher hardly ever do that. And when such encounters do take place, they are hardly well documented and well described. Yennefer sort of has two of them, one against Vilgefortz in the end, where she doesn't really do anything to him, and one against his young apprentice. Reins or Reins or Rians, however his name is pronounced, where she does get the upper hand, but the encounter is very brief and it is seen through the eyes of the confused dandelion, so we barely know what's happening. By contrast, for example, the books have a good amount of well-described fights 
involving non-magic users such as Geralt, Ciri, Leo Bonard, Kair and so on and so forth. But magic is mostly kept limited and mysterious. The Battle of Sodden was likely the biggest military conflict in which lots of mages took part on both sides, but in the books there are no detailed descriptions in terms of how they actually fought. I suppose Vilgefortz is once again the exception to the rule. There are at least a couple of occasions where we get a good idea of what he's capable of in battle, however he is overpowered. And I don't really mind, he's the final boss after all, but just to give you an idea, for those who haven't read the books, it takes the combined effort of Geralt, Yennefer, Regis, and even a tiny bit of Fringilla Vigo to defeat Vilgefort. And Regis sort of dies anyway. There are some parts of that 3v1 fight where Yennefer tries to fight Vilgefort, but like I mentioned, she doesn't really manage to harm him in any way. I think she shielded Geralt from a couple of spells and that was about all she did before Vilgefortz disabled her. So we can't really learn too much that we already didn't know about Yennefer from that confrontation. And when it comes to Triss, well, if memory serves me, there is literally not a single case in the books where she goes toe to toe with another mage. That is actually the case for pretty much every other sorceress. Generally speaking, the mages of this world are not fighters. Sure, they can fight, but their conflicts are resolved through wits and cunning and careful forging of alliances and very rarely through violence. Two things should be partaken cold. Sorrel soup and politics. Calculate and don't let your emotions lead you. So it's actually very likely that mages might prefer to develop their powers in ways which are not necessarily beneficial when it comes to a deadly duel against another mage. To go back to Philippa for a moment, her ability to polymorph is something no other sorceress can perform, yet it won't necessarily help her much in a 1v1 fight, assuming she can only turn into an owl or something similar. Of course, Philippa can do other useful things. My favorite type of magic, lesbomancy. but I think you get what I'm saying. Now, before we take a look at Triss and Yennefer's abilities in the games, I'd like to bring up what are probably their most significant displays of power in the books. For Yennefer, that has got to be her confrontation with the Djinn in the very first book, and for Triss, it would have to be her outburst of power in the very last one, which is more or less the only thing she has going on throughout the whole book series. Now, about the Djinn first, Capturing one is no small feat. Unlike what we saw on Netflix, where it only brought down the roof of one house, in the books it did cause a lot more damage and chaos. And even though capturing of a djinn has been done before by other mages, Yennefer's case is extra difficult, and it's mostly Geralt's fault. Not only is he distracting her, but he's also not saying his last wish, which in turn makes the djinn extra hard to deal with. Yet Yennefer is able to hold him with her magic for a very long time despite all the various interruptions, once again showing her ability to focus and remain steady amidst all the chaos and unforeseen complications, which would be something that's quite useful in our hypothetical fight. Additionally, it's worth mentioning that right before this encounter with the Djinn, she was able to fully mind control Geralt literally using him as a puppet to go around town and do a whole bunch of things while controlling him from a distance. On top of that, it was all against his will. And one more thing I almost forgot to mention about Yennefer is that at one point she is able to cast a spell with her foot instead of her hands, which is quite situational, but it is seen as a rare and curious thing, so if she and Triss got into some kind of weird positions that could come into play? Triss, stop thinking with your vagina and get a hold of yourself. And now let's talk about Triss's hailstorm. In the very end of the books, she and Yennefer find themselves being stoned by an angry peasant mob. They are both mildly injured and they're trying to figure out what to do. It is here where Triss finally finds her backbone and makes an attempt to redeem her lack of bravery at Sodden. 
So she and Yen have a bit of an argument where Yennefer suggests that they should teleport out of here and Triss says that they should cast uh, Alzur's Thunder. Now Yennefer, having the clearer mind once again, does not like the idea because on one hand she thinks they're not in a condition to properly cast this spell and on the other she claims that the spell, even if successful, will kill a few of the peasants but that's about it and the rest will likely finish them off. Triss, however, is all riled up and insists on making a stand and try that spell regardless. And Yennefer's like, eh, whatever, it's not the time to argue, so let's try. And it's looking like they're not going to succeed. And as Yennefer is planning on dropping the spell and trying something else, suddenly this massive magical hailstorm starts raining from the sky. It damages buildings and whatnot, and everyone starts running for their lives. It's actually about to fall down on the sorceresses as well, but Yennefer, who is quite surprised by the sudden appearance of this spell, thankfully manages to shield both of them and barely holds it long enough until the storm subsides. And it's clear that Triss has somehow unleashed this immensely powerful spell, whether subconsciously or by accident or something. The book also makes note, from a future standpoint, that the spell is indeed quite powerful and unique and it has never been produced before or since which suggests that probably even Triss herself couldn't reproduce it afterwards, but essentially, in a last-ditch effort with her life at stake, Triss was able to summon immensely powerful magic, even if she wasn't fully in control of what she was doing. They even dubbed the spell Triss's Hailstorm. Okay, with that said, let's have a look at what they can do in The Witcher games. For the most part, the games stay true to the books in that Yennefer tends to focus primarily on shielding and utilitarian type spells, meanwhile Triss is usually more chaotic and offensive with her magic. There are of course exceptions, Triss can be seen holding a shielding spell to fend off the Scoia'tael archers as Geralt and Roach travel to Flotsam. At least I'll die holding a lovely ass. Not mine. I'll hold the spell. Come on, let's go. And Yennefer just casually fights by shooting lightning bolts from her fingers. I would say that both Triss and Yennefer's most impressive spells are without a doubt the ones they cast during the Battle of Kaer Morhen. Yennefer is able to extend the protective dome produced around these magical staves or whatever these are to an absolutely humongous degree, going from a couple of meters in radius to cover the entire castle. And with this, it's safe to say that she becomes the most valuable defender during the entire battle, because the moment her strength runs out, it's basically over. Triss, on the other hand, is first able to conjure a bunch of fireballs to stop one of the waves of Wild Hunt warriors. Next time you get the feeling I'm about to piss off Marigold, make sure and knock me upside the head. And then, moments later, she more or less repeats her powerful spell from the books, except with fire this time all the while apparently shielding the witchers from the destructive spell. Now that last part is a little questionable because, on one hand, Lambert says that we shouldn't worry because Marigold will shield us. Don't stop! Marigold will shield us! But on the other, he himself immediately rushes to shield us when the spell begins. So maybe he was worried for no reason, or maybe Triss only thought of shielding us after the initial round of fireballs, who knows. And of course, before that point and afterwards, she keeps on fighting constantly within the castle walls. So in my opinion, both sorceresses make about an equal display of power here. It's true that Yennefer's spell is more essential, the whole plan would simply not work otherwise, but also if there was an entire horde of wild hunt warriors showing up inside the castle, the plan would likely not work anyway. Now, outside of the Battle of Kaer Morhen, they each cast a variety of spells, Triss uses Hydromancy Divination to locate Philippa, she casts this Hold Person type of spell on potentially two different people, she can wipe a person's mind, she can reverse artifact compression, uh, she can close wild hunt portals and generally shoot fire at people, and of course there was the Butterfly Shielding spell from The Witcher 2. Meanwhile, Yennefer does some crucial and powerful stuff of her own. With a little help from the Ansevern Ida, she's able to sustain Uma while going through the trials. She uses necromancy to reanimate Skell's body, 
which according to Tris is beyond a line she's willing to cross. Haven't sunken that low just yet. Yennefer did it. It was the only way we... I'm not Yennefer, Geralt. Again, going back to the whole part where Yennefer is simply more willing to do whatever it takes. What else do we have? She's never shown wiping minds, but she can read Geralt's mind quite easily and even control it if she wishes to, like she does in The Last Wish. Geralt, please move before I'm forced to place it down on your head. And let's not forget that she casts quite the remarkable offensive spell too during the intro cinematic against the poor Nilf Guardians and even does cool little things like having a magical raven familiar. So ultimately, I would say that in terms of the raw power of their spells, as Triss and Yennefer are portrayed in the end of the third game, they are about equal. And so we come to the final verdict. Well, as you may have guessed, I choose Yennefer as the winner of this confrontation. My voice has started to die, but we're almost done. Um, so, yeah, I think under certain circumstances, specifically if the fight erupts rather suddenly and at rather close range, Triss might catch Yennefer off guard and simply overwhelm her with her chaotic spells. And I suppose there is a small chance that Triss gets herself killed by accident. But if the two are aware that a fight between them will take place and they each get some time to prepare for it, then I think Yennefer's experience, discipline, combined with the willingness to do whatever it takes, will give her too much of an advantage and will make victory for Triss nearly impossible. And yes, technically Triss will get time to prepare as well, but I think she's simply not that well equipped to handle the various and well-rounded powers of Yennefer. Additionally, if we escalate things even further and say that the two fight with a team on each side, or perhaps even commanding armies, then, once again, the odds favor Yennefer much more for the reasons I already mentioned. So there we have it. In my opinion, Yennefer wins, and I will definitely be pitting her against Philippa Eilhart in another video. Okay, that was it. Oh, wait, wait, I forgot. I promised to talk about Triss's scars and allergies, so let's address that quickly. Triss is said to be allergic to magic, specifically when digesting magically enhanced potions. Then, there's another seemingly unrelated part where Triss complains how she will never be able to wear deeply cut clothes because of the scars on her chest. Now, there is a question here that arises naturally. Why can't she magically remove or hide the scars? Both things are sort of done in the books already. There's a sorceress who magically removed the freckles from her body, there is another one who is missing half of her face and replaces it with an illusion that looks quite convincing. And of course, pretty much all sorceresses magically enhance their appearance. Now, the proper reason for why she can't remove the scars is never given. And so that, plus the allergy to magical potions, has sparked several theories among the fans. For example, that Triss is actually really, really young because she can't possibly enhance her looks for the same reason she couldn't remove her scars. And also, by extension, that she is probably extra vulnerable to magic. I personally find these theories extremely unlikely. Once again, by all accounts, Triss was already a grown woman before Ciri was even born. A couple of years or so before that. So she can't naturally look the way she does at such an advanced age. What's probably even more important is that I don't think the books would just ignore such a fact about her, if it was really true. As for why the games mention the scars but don't include them... How are those scars she got at Sodden? Still there? Lambert. Not funny. I don't know. It could be some misunderstanding between the various teams who developed them, um, just how The Witcher 3's Codex claims that Triss has blue eyes, but her actual in-game model has green eyes. Okay, that was it. To those who made it all this way, I thank you very much for watching. Tell me what you think of all of this. Do you agree or disagree? Is there anything I should have mentioned which I didn't? I will say that I haven't reread the books in preparation for this video, so it's possible that I missed something in there. Finally, special thanks to my YouTube members and supporters on Patreon, and until the next video, stay tuned and be good.